So we will try to give the conference on the, the requested conference. It's been requested for a while. I've given it before, or at least in different. It's actually quite a large topic that could be, it could be a book. It would be a nice book. But I'm not a writer of books, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, but somebody else who has a brain might be able to write a book about this. So reflection on religious life as liturgy. Um, I didn't have a lot of time, so I've just kind of focused on one little aspect. But to give an idea, liturgy, we'll take it from Scripture. There are three different times in uh, the New Testament where they, they, they use the word le torre gikein. And they use it for different things. Le, uh, le torre gikein. I think that accent would be over the I, but I'm not sure it's Greek. And I don't exactly know where the accent goes. But it's a biblical, it's a biblical word. But when they translate it, they don't say liturgy. But obviously, le turgikein would be liturgy, right? It's a word, it's liturgy. They use it in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 23, when it talks about Simeon going in for the office of sacrifice. And he uses the word office. So it, it translates the word le turgikein as office. It translates as, as office. And he goes into the office. Remember, he's, he, was the high, he was the priest that year that had to go and give the, at the hour of incense. He had to offer the sacrifice of incense, the liturgy of, act, uh, of, of offering incense. <clears throat> no, the incense is a sacrifice because it's destroying something. Remember that um, the word sacrifice itself, it, it has to do with changing, destroying um, uh, something of, of value. Okay. Then Acts of the Apostles 13.2 the word uh, le turgikein is, is, is uh, translated as ministering. It's when the, when the apostles were there ministering, then they laid their hands on the deacons. Right? They were, they were, no, no, sorry. They, they, received, they received word um, that they were to send off Barnabas and Paul. They were ministering, and what they were doing was they were... Uh, they had the liturgy. They were probably offering the divine liturgy at that point in time when they received the command of our Lord to send those two off, to lay their hands on them and send them off. Then there's 1 Corinthians 10.21 where the word le turgikein is used for table of the devil or table of the Lord. You remember? 1 Corinthians 10.21. That's the Eucharistic chapter. It's talking about the um, <clears throat> table of the Lord. Let me just read it to you real quick, if I can find it real quick. 1 Corinthians. Oops. <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians 10.13. Oh, no, I'm sorry, not 13. It's a uh, 21. I'm getting that things. I'll give just a little bit above it. What then? Do I say that what is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? I'm oh, sorry. Chapter 11 is the Eucharistic one, but he's building up to it. Is anything? Or that the idol is, is anything? But the thing which uh, the heathens sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils. And not to God. And I would not that you should be made partakers with devils. Now here's chapter, here's verse 21. You cannot drink the chalice of the Lord and the chalice of devils. You cannot, you cannot be partakers of the table of the Lord and the table of devils. The word table there is taken from the Greek translation 
of liturgy, uh, of liturgy, do you see? Table. So either the table of the Lord or the table of the devil. And you can't be partakers. Uh, you have to be partakers of either one or the other. So in looking at this, when we look at the word liturgy, when we use the word liturgy, we mean public worship of God. Not everything's liturgy. We might call certain things liturgy, like they'll call something a paraliturgy. Well, it's not official public worship of God. It's something that we can go do, like the Stations of the Cross is a, well, some people refer that to as a quasi-liturgy because it's almost, it's almost, it's almost established as a real liturgy. They had, you can erect the, the stations, it's in the Roman ritual. A Franciscan can do it and it's indulgenced. So it's become a liturgy that's, that's quasi-liturgical. The same thing with Eucharistic benediction. It's not a real liturgy, n- meaning real public worship of God, but it's become quasi-liturgical because of how it's regulated by the church. But when we talk about public liturgy, what we mean is we mean the holy sacrifice of the Mass, And the office, what the rule says of St. Francis is that the divine office, meaning the mass and the office. That's liturgy. That's the public worship of God. So the worship of God is part of the act of religion. When we get through, I'm not going to go into all that stuff. I've done it before when we talk about liturgy and stuff like that. But the... It's a beautiful thing to look at the virtues and how they all come together. The the virtue of religion, part of the virtue of religion is worship. It's sacrifice. It's vows. All things that we do in religious life, right? So religion, the virtue of religion, is that great virtue that binds us more closely to God. And all of those things that fall underneath religion are things that bind us to different degrees more tightly to God. That's why it means, well, some, it's, it's, the, it's disputed, but some people means, th- believe that religion would come from the word relegare, to, to bind oneself to. Others dispute it. But for our purpose right now, it makes a lot of sense. Actually, the word religion does make a lot of sense if you think of it that way, because all the acts that, that, that come from the virtue of religion are things that are draw us closer into the service of God. For what? Is worship. That's what we're doing. We want to glorify God, right? So we want to bind ourselves to God. Some of the most noteworthy of these ways to bind ourselves to God are vows, which would be secondary to sacrifice. Sacrifice is what we find directly in the Mass. The Mass is a sacrifice. Now, it doesn't matter what rite you're using. It's a sacrifice. We refer to it in the Roman rite as the holy sacrifice of the Mass. But that doesn't change it in any other rite. That's what it is. It is the reliving of Calvary. That, that, that reenactment, which is made present to us in an, in an unbloody manner, it's just, it's just, uh, it just comes down to us from apostolic time through different cultures. So we have different rites, Right? But it's the same sacrifice offered by the same priest, Jesus Christ, every time. And because of that, because it's offered by a priest who's God, it's offered by a victim who's God, it's the most perfect thing, meaning it offers offers perfect worship, fitting worship, not fitting, perfectly acceptable worship to God. Do you see? Whereas everything else isn't necessarily perfectly fitting, perfectly acceptable. It can be acceptable because God accepts it, but it's not, it's not perfectly in conformity with his, his, the, the awesomeness of God, whereas the, the liturgy does that. Do you see? The liturgy itself, because it's offered by the second person of the Holy Trinity in his humanity and his divinity, and he's also the, he's, he, he's the priest who offers himself as the victim to God the Father. You have a perfect, you have a perfectly acceptable sacrifice, a perfectly acceptable and fitting act of worship 
to God the Father. And it's one of the only things you can find that you could actually say that. Probably, it's probably is the only thing you could find you could say that about because everything else will be offered by us, like the offering of the, the, the breviary, which is the official prayer of the church. Understand, that is the official prayer of the church, not the mass, not the divine liturgy. It's the office. The chanting of the Psalms, at least in the Roman Rite, that is the official, if a priest doesn't say his office, mortal sin. If he doesn't say mass, he might be culpable of a fault or something because he was lazy or negligent, because he maybe just wanted to have his day off or something like that, I don't know. But it's not mortal sin not to say mass if he's not being commanded by his bishop to do so. You see? He's being commanded by the church to pray the, pray the office all the hours. And so are... Um, well, it gets more complicated. So are religious, but in, in certain degrees. I mean, be, before Paul VI, it was only for choir. Uh, those who were clerical brothers or choir monks or choir nuns to pray that had a duty to pray the office. Or if it was in their constitutions, they had to pray the office. Now, after Paul VI, everyone's supposed to pray the office, but now that people are returning to tradition, uh, it only makes sense that they're returning also to a form of tradition that has to be compatible to it. If you're not using the the liturgy of the hours, which only takes a very short time to say, uh, some community life won't function if you have everybody saying the full breviary all the time. So you have to have people that don't have to do it. So there's people who are conforming to the old law on this. And, and from what I've understood from canon lawyers and certain cardinals, it's a very acceptable way to interpret the law. So when we look at sacrifice... And we'll get back to the vows, but when we, get to, when we look at sacrifice, we, it has four ends. We always want to keep those four ends in mind because those four ends also have to do with our vows, right? It's not just the Mass. We don't, when, when you deal with these kind of things in the virtue of religion, we, we don't need to segregate everything like we like to do. Kind of, Well, that's just for the Mass. So that's just for the breeder. That's just for religious. That's just for the priest. That's just for lay people. No, it, it, all kind of, it all kind of gets stirred up together in a way. But the four ends of sacrifice, and another just thing to throw out there is anyone who's consecrated, that is set apart, can offer sacrifice. So that means these four ends of sacrifice can be applied to anyone or anything that is consecrated and set apart. Anyone who's baptized is consecrated and set apart. And then you have, le- you have varying degrees of that consecration all the way up through you know, the consecration in religious life, the consecration in holy orders, the consecration of bishops, the consecration of the Pope. You just have different levels of this consecration. So those four ends are adoration, reparation, petition, thanksgiving. Those are the four ends of of our divine worship in sacrifice, when we make sacrifice. So we already said that adoration which we offer, that sacrifice that gets offered, the adoration element, it is, it is a perfect act of adoration in the Mass. The Mass is a perfect act of adoration of God. Perfectly acceptable to God. Perfectly worthy of God. Even if the priest is in mortal sin, that Mass is perfectly worthy of God because He's only an instrument. The actual priest is Christ Himself, right? That's where we have to know that. We can't always get, people just get so scrupulous today about every little thing. And part of that is, is like trying to even judge the intention of the priest and the, and, and, the, and the sins of the priest and whatever. It doesn't, He's an instrument for Christ. He was consecrated so that Christ could use him for the consecration of the host for the forgiveness of sins and for affecting the other, the other sacraments. There's also the, there's the element of the objective and the subjective. The objective is the ex opera operato. That is a perfect offering, an objective offering. It's a perfect outpouring of grace. It's a perfect working of sanctification is a better way to put it. A perfect working of sanctification. And that act of adoration in the Mass is perfectly worthy of God even if the priest is a wretched dog. Do you see? Wretched dog in the sense that not of his priesthood, but because 
he runs himself through you know, things that dogs would do because he lives a filthy life. Even then, it's perfectly worthy of God because it doesn't, doesn't depend on him, it depends on Christ. He's just heaping coals on his own head. Reparation Reparation is that thing that's most necessary because we live especially in a time where God's constantly offended. Now, you can apply this. I'm not going to do most of that, but you can apply this to religious life. You can apply all this to religious life. The offering through adoration and what that should look like in offering to God. The reparation and why we even enter into religious life. But why do we have to have reparation in the church still? First and foremost, Christ offers himself on the cross to appease an offended God. Not to save you. See, see, we always want to put ourselves first. The first and, first and foremost, it was not us, it was God. He wanted to appease an offended God and no one could do it. Only God could do it. And that's why the incarnation, well, that's why the, at the incarnation our Lord had to suffer. <clears throat> Perspective is reparation the most necessary, like on our part, or uh, can, you, can you just kind of explain more about what you mean by reparation is the most necessary? Uh, I don't know if it's the most necessary, it's most pressing. Did I say necessary? Anyways, it's the most pressing. It's the most pressing because God's been offended and He's continuously offended. So not only does reparation have to be made on our part for our sins, we hope our past sins. Uh, that we don't keep heaping more and more on there. But for our past sins especially, <clears throat> and then any good Christian has to try to make reparation for all those who will not appease an offended God. And that's where the treasury of grace comes from. That we, we call on the saints because the saints have, they've built up such a treasury of, they've made reparation for their sins, and then they made reparation for mountains of other people's sins. And so we're able to, to enter into that treasury um, that the, ch the church can dispense to us or that God grants through that servant of God when we pray to that servant of God because he wants to honor that servant of God for all that they did in this life. It's most pressing because God not, he, he ought not ever be offended. And that's all we do is offend him. Because we have the idea that we're the most important thing and God's our servant. And so we offend him. But the whole, the whole point is, like, when God's offended, it throws everything out of whack. And that's why the whole world's in, 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 in completely disordered right now. It just throws everything out of whack. You see it beginning with Adam and Eve, and it just gets worse and worse. Every once in a while, God will purify everything by sending sulfur down and destroying all the homosexuals in Sodom. And then later on, he'll do it. I mean, he wiped everybody out with the flood, but I guess it was before that. And then there might be plagues that come or earthquakes that come or whatever else. But now it seems like he doesn't do anything. He just lets you go. That's not a good sign. <laughs> like People think, oh, we're at peace. It's like, you know, it, it, it's gotten so bad, God doesn't do anything. Because the worst punish, punishment you can have is not to be punished by God. It's like the worst thing that could happen right now. So we need to make reparation because he shouldn't be offended. And those who love him should want to make reparation because people offend him. We have to appease an offended God. Then we make petition. We are in greatly need, first, of light and grace. We have to petition God for the things that are of God, not just to make sure we get all the things we want this job or that so-and-so doesn't have cancer anymore or all the things of life. But first and foremost, that we have light and understanding that we receive the grace that we need not to sin and, we do, and more so that we have the, the grace to cooperate with it. The thing is, when you start to realize and you start to understand that your job is to face whatever God wants you to face, you find yourself constantly praying just for courage. 
because you know you don't have, you probably don't have the strength to face what God's getting ready to ask you to do. Right now you're at peace, you're happy, you're praying to God. Tomorrow you're going to get slammed in the face with some kind of very difficult thing that makes you fall to your knees begging God and wondering, why are you doing this to me, right? But that doesn't happen if you're constantly begging for courage to face whatever he wants you to face. That's a beautiful prayer. Courage to face whatever you want me to face. You see? But that's petition. And that really should be the bulk of our prayers. Not trying to get from God whatever we want or whatever we think we need, but constantly begging from God that His will be manifested and that we have the courage to do it. The wisdom to see it and the courage to do it. If people would do that, things would all move smoothly. It's like, it's like that's a prayer that's like injecting the grease into the different joints of the tractor. See that? Bring it to a practical level. You got to inject the grease into the joints of the tractor so it all moves right. Well, that's the thing with the, the, the prayer that we have to have. It has to, what would make the fun, what would make everything in, in our life and in the world move properly is doing God's will. But to be able to do that, there has to be, we have to understand it. Not that we have to have a clear idea. I just have to know that, hey, I got to face this thing. Then I have to, cur- I have, to have the courage to face that thing. Because that, that's usually what's lacking is the courage. Do you see? It, it, the, 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 the steadfast endurance in the difficult trial that never seems to end because everything you've desired just, just got washed away. And now you're standing there looking like it's all failed. Where's God? God's in the failure. Are you kidding me? He's like getting ready to make you a superhero. You just pray for the wisdom and the courage to face the thing, and you, and you, and you got it. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to. You were made to do that right now. Do you see? But it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't align with what you desire. And that's why we turn into whiny babies before God, and then we also start to get to the point of blaspheming. You know, saying God doesn't love us. God doesn't this. God doesn't this. He doesn't hear my prayers. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, because what do we have that we haven't been given? There's nothing. Absolutely nothing. If you have any talent, you received it. If you have any good, you've received it. If you've been taken care of, you've received that. If providence was not functioning in your life right now, you would not exist anymore. That's the whole point about providence. You can just picture it in your, I mean, God doesn't have hands and stuff like that. But, but if you can picture God's hand, this is what people like to do. They like to picture God's hand holding everything in providence. And that's what it means. He's holding everything in existence. Existence itself, as long as he cares for what exists, then it has all that it needs. If existence itself, which is God, ceases to care about what exists because it came from existence itself, then it doesn't exist anymore. So as long as God cares for us, all providence is taken care of. He provides everything that we need, loves us, uh, I, I guess you could even say infinitely because he's loved us since, uh, since infinity. And he holds everything in being and perfectly provides for everything. And that's when people start to blaspheme. Yeah, but what about cancer? Yeah, but what about abuse? Yeah, but what about... He left men to be free. He left men to be free, and men do that. They call it the iniqui, in, 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 iniquitatis, uh, mysterium iniquitatis. It's something we don't understand, but as St. Paul reassures us, it all works for the good. Everything, everything that God allows to happen even when evil men act freely on their own will to do evil, he uses that to work for the good. He turns everything into good because goodness can only turn things into goodness. But you can't see it if you're blaspheming. So that's why that, that's the point is that you, you get blinded by you being at the center of everything and God being your servant. And when things don't go the way you want it, you get upset about stuff and you blaspheme God. So thanksgiving, because we have to realize all goodness comes from God. And even the wickedness in the world that that touches us or affects us, God will turn into goodness. Because in the end, as long as you keep your eyes locked on God, uh, uh, in, in the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and begging the Holy Ghost for all the other virtues, 
you're going to see that how every adversity and every horrible thing that happens always leads to something very good. And what it probably leads to is you become a saint. That's a good thing, because that's what we were born, we were born to do that. So these are almost perfectly summed up or brought to completion in the Mass. But we can also find something very, very closely knit to the continuation of this act of religion, and that is found in the state of religious life. So we're going to apply it to religious life, which is a saint, um, not saint, but Leo XIII, when he wrote to Cardinal Gibbons, I think it was Cardinal Gibbons, here in the United States, he was a cardinal there in um, New York, he wrote him something because Americanism was already taken off here in America. And religious were wanting to change the religious vows to things like hospitality and care of your neighbor and stuff like that. It was all social, it was, it was kind of jumping into social justice stuff, right? And uh, the good, the, that, that, very, uh, that very good and wise Pope, very learned Pope, and a, and a Franciscan third order, <clears throat> He wrote a beautiful letter about religious life, and in it he referred to the religious as, now no one believes this today, but he referred to them as the, um, the elite, the elite Christian forces within the church, the elite Christian forces, and you would never know it today. Religious are considered kind of those people who just, like, a, like I heard that one Catholic, I put quotes, Catholic blogger say, they're just those consecrated people who live together. I couldn't believe hearing that kind of thing. Of course, he was promoting the domestic priesthood. So the domestic priesthood, that's nice. He has to, he's the high priest over his domestic household. And there's, some, there's, there's truth to that, but there's also great exaggeration in this fellow. So the, the, the religious were just those consecrated people who live in houses together. There you go. That's the end, end of that vocation. But if we really look at the religious state as the elite of the of the Christian faithful, what it means is we're those faithful because religious life is for anyone who, anyone, any baptized Christian who doesn't have some impediment that will allow them to enter religious life, they can enter religious life so they can more heroically live their Christian, uh, their Christian vocation. Now, in this, in this case, we use vocation as sanctification because everybody likes to throw the word vocation around but our Christian vocation being sanctification. In this case, it is a vocation because it's a divine or a supernatural calling. And that's when we use, theologically, that's when we use the word vocation. That's why we don't apply it to marriage in that sense. We apply it to marriage more in a natural sense because we all have that calling in our flesh. But those who enter into religious life desire, the desire to, though they still have that desire, that that calling in their flesh to married life, they choose something better. And by choosing something better, they consecrate themselves to God through the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Those vows are a sacrifice. You see, now we get right back to it. Now you find, you find an element that's lived and religious day in and day out. The Mass is offered once a day. By priests. Well, now you'd say, well, what about the Novus Ordo priests? They have to run around and say 15 Masses. Well, that's just because things are falling apart right now. But normally a priest says one Mass a day. They used to be able to, and if they were to say a second Mass, they had to have permission. Now it's just known you've got to drive around and say 15 Masses every day because that's what keeps the, the business open, right? It's, a, it's a, just kind of a shame the way things are being done. But the sacrifice of a religious isn't something they do just in the morning. It's something that they live day in and day out, offering that perfect worship to God, though it is not, it's, it's analogous to that of the Mass. It is, not, it is not comparable or equal in any way. So we're just making, we're making a comparison from the, the great sacrifice of the Mass, but it, it being lived out in an individual who's consecrated to God, okay? This is how we're to see how religious life itself can be lived as liturgy. So we see it in the sacrifice of our vows, but the vows of a religious are public acts. Remember, liturgy is public worship of God. A religious 
publicly makes an act of religion for worship of God by vowing to live before the whole Christian people in the church poverty, chastity, and obedience. And some groups have other vows too. But the essential binding of oneself to God is poverty, chastity, and obedience. Because some people say they're, they're religious, they're bound to God, and they have one vow. But that, that's not, not really how it works. It, it's poverty, chastity, and obedience. It's the threefold concupiscence that St. John talks about that we're, we're sacrificing. You see? And we offer this act of worship to the living God in our vows. As our vows are public acts, so too our lives become public. We wear a, pub, we wear a habit. People know that we represent the church in some capacity. Now, I am not speaking here about canonical. Canonically, you have different levels. You have, you have pontifical, you have diocesan, you have public, you have private associations of the faithful, but you also have de facto groups of religious life, and that's the beginnings of religious life. Now, the scrupulous people today don't understand that kind of thing. They freak out if you're not a pontifical group, or if you're not this kind of group, you're not that kind of... Religious life starts at its lowest level as a de facto group of religious life. Whether it's lay people coming together or people who want to take vows or whatever else it is, they're coming together in some capacity to do a good thing. And this has always been recognized by the church and is still recognized by canon law today. But still, there's this, there's this openness, there's this public aspect of, of a Christian who wants to donate themselves to God before the church. Meaning that the living expression of our vows puts us, in a, in a, in, in, puts, us into, puts us into practice as becoming a living and public sacrifice. Because if, if, if a religious, again, we can't, we can't segregate things. Well, I made those vows that day. I made that sacrifice. Okay, but do you have to keep living those vows? Do you renew those vows? No, that's just it. When a religious takes a vow of poverty, he has to live that vow and strive to live that vow every single day until he dies. Evaluating whether, not being scrupulous, but evaluating whether or not he's, he's, he's properly participating and offering that act of worship to God properly and where he has to adjust it, where he has to break himself of little attachments that he might have or little things he might be collecting in his cell or books he might be attached to and every going, going through and putting those things back and kind of cleaning out, starting over, offering the sacrifice and so on and so forth with the other vows. But they're things that have to be lived always. Every time we go into public and you go to hike a public trail and everybody's wearing superhero clothing uh, or less than that, you know, you, you, your, your vow of chastity has to come in to help guide the eyes, to keep direct, redirecting the heart, to keep helping us focus on our, our intention to offer to God that we are not our own person anymore. We're not, we don't have those faculties to use for ourselves. We've offered them to God. We have no right, as St. Anthony says, to lie with our eyes. That's what he calls it. Looking at the ladies when you're not supposed to be. Lying with your eyes. <clears throat> So some offer sacrifices daily, but the religious accepts a life of sacrifice to live a type of conformity to the eternal sacrifice. Now, I'm not getting into the eternal sacrifice, making a judgment of whether or not there's a, 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 a mass offered in heaven or not. It seems it when you read about, when you read Apocalypse. When, when you do read an Apocalypse, you seem to see there's this, there's this, uh, there's this liturgy that's taking place in heaven, uh, unraveling before your eyes right there in Apocalypse. But what we want to talk about is the eternal sacrifice, meaning Christ dying on the cross. He told us to pick up our cross and follow him. He says if we want to be his disciples, we have to carry our cross. What he's telling us, if we want to follow him, if we want to be conformed to Him, if we want to uh, imitate Him, we don't just have to carry a cross, which means sacrifice. We have to die on Calvary. Do you see? It's all about the life, the death, 
and the resurrection of Christ. We don't just live the cross, meaning carrying it. That's what people, you see that in Christians all the time when they're talking about it. They seem to think it's all about just, you know, I broke a nail, I gotta offer that up. I you know, I, I didn't get I didn't get the the I didn't get the, the kind of chocolate ice cream I wanted, so I gotta offer that up. You, you, you've got these little sacrifices you've got to make all day long, and those are good virtuous things to do. But the sacrifice we're trying to enter into is the is a completeness. There's a there's a completeness within imitation of Christ. It starts from birth, it starts in being hidden, it starts in being persecuted and under, misunderstood. It starts in being um, the, in, in, in his passion and the humiliation that goes along with it, his death on Calvary, his resurrection. It's all of it. That's, that's the history of salvation. We're asked to enter into it in imitation of our Lord. That's supposed to be our public worship of God as a religious. That's why we don't lament. We, we beg the courage to face it. But we don't lament when the difficulties come. We want to face it. So we face these things or might face these things daily and in different degrees. This eternal sacrifice that we're, we're trying to enter into. Not that our sacrifice is eternal, but in that, that imitation of our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. In sacrifice, there must always be an altar. Now this is an essential element of our, of our, of our faith. But, but nowadays when people talk about worship, they just talk about worship as singing rock and roll songs and putting your hands up. And you even see it in the Catholic world with all these funny programs they have at different universities with the different names that are catchy and you can put on t-shirts. But they're basically following a Protestant model. For us, we know that sacrifice, we were made for it. We know that the churches, we, we were told that we are temples of the Holy Ghost. A temple is made for an altar. And an altar is made for a sacrifice. Do you see? We are made for sacrifice. St. Paul, or St. Peter, I'm sorry, even calls us a priest, a royal priesthood. And that's a very true thing. It's people don't like to talk about it now because they talked about it at Vatican II, and it seemed to, it seemed to lead to like ladies going up in tight shorts handing out the Eucharist. I mean... You, you see this weird stuff happening all over the place and they, they call it the priesthood now. I, I, I don't know. But that's not, what, that's not what the church meant before. That's probably not what Vatican II meant and it's not what St. Peter meant. What St. Peter means is there is a, if you're a Christian in a state of grace is so perfectly conformed to Christ, there's like a oneness that happens there. It's what gets you into heaven because there's no separating you from Christ if you're in sanctifying grace. No separating you from Christ. The love that God has for you, he finds in you because he finds something that is him, of, of himself. So we're deified. It's a hard thing to say. But even, even our Lord said that when he, when, when, I won't get into all that. But anyways, when he talks about it, he said, did the, the, the scripture not say that you are God's? Well, he brings that to realization when he fills us with his sanctifying grace. And by doing it, it deifies us. It sanctifies us, meaning it takes us from natural creatures to supernatural creatures and only in Christ, which brings a oneness because it's in his body. Do you see? That's a big deal. And it's a hard thing to even understand what that means. But in that, in that priesthood that's which given to us, we do have an altar because we have a temple. And we do have a sacrifice because we have an altar. Do you see? Now, there's different levels of what that sacrifice might be. For our, for our, what we want to talk about is that sacrifice is going to come from our religious observance, our public act of consecration, which is poverty, chastity, and obedience, our vows. The oblation is our will, and the Holocaust is our whole life. Do you see? The oblation, see, they have these different words for sacrifices. The oblation, we're just going to say the oblation is what's offered on the altar. I'm not going to go into more detail. The Holocaust is what's completely burnt up, offered, sacrificed, and destroyed. Remember, sacrifice has to be, it has to be destroyed. It has to be changed in some way. It has to be poured out, a libation. It has to be burnt up on the altar, a Holocaust. There has to be some way that this sacrifice is consumed. Do you see? 
So we offer ourselves as an oblation, that is of our will. But then our entire being, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Our personal property, which every man has a right to have, we give it up. The ability to have a family and the consolation of a wife and children, you're free. Chastity is the most beautiful thing that God allows men to live. And that's why St. Paul said, I just wish you'd all be like me. You could just be like me. Chastity frees you. People don't realize it because when the passions are raging in the body, you think that you have to have this outlet and men think they're going to find that in marriage. The freedom to walk with the angels, to not be a slave to your passions, to overcome that, it's like being a giant on earth. And God gives us the ability. It doesn't, it doesn't make us, the vow doesn't make us giants on earth. But entering into that, and the reason I say giants on earth, someone's going to say, well, that's strange. Why are you even saying that? What else would it mean to say that the angels walk side by side to us in equal dignity when you're pure and chaste? It's like being a giant on earth because the whole world bows down to the sensual. Recently, I was just called a Puritan. I'm a perfect Puritan preacher because I talked about purity. Can you believe it? Purity is what makes us like the angels. But the reason we walk side by side in an equal dignity with the angels, because they get it for free. We have to fight for it. And they recognize that. And they honor it. And that's why they'll walk side by side with you if you're pure and chaste. So the hardest thing for us to offer isn't our chastity. Because that's an, you, you start to see that's a a tremendous gift that God gives us. It's the will. To be told, to be told to go do something you absolutely don't want to do. To want to hold on to something that you want something to be yours and be told you can't have that. To have to obey in all things that are not sin. Even if you don't want to. This is the hardest thing for a man to do because he has to give up his own self. This is the greatest sacrifice that a man can make. And it's the most beautiful one because it brings him to humility and makes him like Christ who said he came only to do the will of him who sent him. Do you see? And that was to die. Do you see? That's the Holocaust. Do you see the liturgy? Do you see how it can be played out? A life of a religious is someone who gets to live the cross day in and day out being consumed on an altar of holocaust if they're striving for the ends of religion, the glorification of God. And for you, that would be through poverty, chastity, and obedience. So we are consecrated because those vows do that. For these ends, to give sacrifice and clean oblation to God are le turgikein, Then can be summed up this way. When we look at office, because remember, we we looked at those three different times it's used in Scripture St. Luke, in Acts of the Apostles, and St. Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians. (coughs) Office, ministering, and table. These are the three times when uh, Le Turgikein is used. in the Greek, then these are, these are replaced by offering, ministering, and table. How does that apply to us? We want to look at that so we can see how it is that we're turning, we ought to turn or ought to live um, uh, a constant offering of a liturgy, a public worshiping of God through our religious observance, office. If we look at the office, he was going at the hour of incense. To offer an oblation, not an oblation, but a a sacrifice of incense. To consume the incense on the altar of God. To send up a a fragrance to the living God. How do we do that? Imitation of Christ. We do that by trying to imitate and become perfectly conformed to our dear blessed Lord. And how do we do that? Through virtue. The practice of the virtues. The growth in virtues and holiness. Do you see? Because a life that's going to be lived this way is like an offering of incense. You don't have the the stale, stenchy stank of a soul that just keeps wallowing in the mire. No. 
It's a beautiful fragrance. St. Pio, they always said he, people were scandalized because St. Pio it smelled like he had perfume on. It's because his soul smelled beautiful. It was a, it was a, a grazia gratis date that God allowed for St. Pio that, that the, the, the fragrance of his soul emanated from him so people could smell it. But the hardship was St. Pio could smell the soul of sinners, the stench of sinners. So if we live, if we live the virtue of Christ, if we live the imitation of Christ, which religious life is supposed to be for us, if we actually try to live that and strive for that, then you're sending up a beautiful, you have an office, a liturgy of sending up a beautiful <coughs> wafting sense of incense to God. Right? And that's what we like to see in the churches. We like to see in those big churches with large ceilings and that you see the, the, the plumes of smoke going up. It represents that. But we, we like to think, well, I just love it when the, the server stays there and he just swings the thing forever and there's smoke everywhere. Yeah, but you're supposed to do, that's only a representation. That, that incense isn't doing anything. It, it just, it's, an, it's something we can see. We can visually see what our souls should be doing all the time. Do you see? And to a greater degree. So we can't stop at the fact that I really like it on Sunday when they just swing that thing like crazy and it's just like smoking. It, it, that, 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 that's great. But that, that, that's something for you to see what you're supposed to be doing. And you do that through perfect imitation of Christ. Entering into the virtues and trying to sanctify every realm or aspect of your life. That's your office. That's your liturgy. Because you become a public, a public servant of God. People expect it from you. That's why it's a lie if you're not doing it and they see us in the habit. It's a lie because they presume that's what you're doing. That's why when you go out some places and, and you see these people, we haven't seen it much because we're around a lot of Protestants, but when, when the people come up to you, they'll sometimes weep. Why? Is it because of me? No, they don't know me. They want Christ. And they're presuming because you're dressed that way. Because they're presuming you live a certain way. They're presuming that in some way, Christ can be found in you. That's a beautiful thing. For the ministering, Acts 13.2. That would be the unfolding of our duties according to our obedience, our orarium, that is keeping the schedule faithfully each day. This is why we have to think about these things. We don't just try to get the prayer so we don't have to kneel in the middle of the choir and wait for the friar responsible to knock. No, we, we, we do it because the bell rang and we need to do a better job of trying to get there as soon as the bell rings. And I've been a bad example of it. And we just, as a group, bell rings, we, we go to the chapel. Our Lord called us, we have to go there. Now it's time for us to pray. Okay, that's what we exist for. We don't exist for cutting boards and making benches and cutting down trees and feeding chickens, playing with bees and whatever else we do. It, that, that's not what we exist for. We're workers. I mean, I'm sorry, we're prayers and not workers. That's the, that's the point we have to have. We're prayers. So when, when the bell rings, it's because our Lord's calling us back. He wants us to stand before Him and chant His psalms. Do you see? So ministering, though we're not ministering at the altar, as this is probably referring to, to the apostles, in the Acts of the Apostles before sending up St. Barnabas and St. Paul. But we're applying it in a way for our schedule, our daily life, the living day in and day out of our, of our schedule before the living God. That is doing what we're asked to do, not doing what we want to do. There's a difference. We always have to be examining ourselves to see what is it that we want and what is it that God wants. Eventually, you'll get to the point where you don't think about what is it that you want because you don't want anything. You could care less. Just tell me what to do and I'm going to go do it. I'm a religious. This is what I'm supposed to do. Whatever you tell me. It's, it's, a, it's the strangest thing asking her, what would you like? <laughs> I don't know. What, what do you mean, what, do I, what would I like? You know? Would you like a steak or would you like chicken? Ah, just please bring something here for me to eat. Just give me something to eat. Tell, tell me what I'm supposed to tell you and I'll tell you. The thing is, we don't really know. We don't care. We form ourselves on being conformed. Right? 
Does that make sense? We form ourselves in being, being present to other people as we ought to be, not making ourselves the center of whatever's going on. We're servants. We're servants of God. We're the least. We want to be the least. Tell me what to do. Show me where to go. And that's why we should be easily dealt with by people. People are always asking when we go and visit somewhere, they call us out to give a talk or something like that. They always think we're going to be very demanding. We didn't want to make any decisions so you could make a... I was like, listen, I came here to be told what to do. I'm not making any decisions. You tell me where to go. You tell me what to do. You tell me what to eat. You tell me at what time. I'll do all of it. I'll do... And they hear that sometimes, but that never really happens. People always like to assert themselves. No, I think it'd be better if we did this. No, I'm, I'm serious. Just tell me what to do. I'm going to go do it. That's what religious, that's what religious should do. I've come here to serve you. Tell me what to do. Now, if it interferes with certain things that are, you know, of course, like, we want you to go out and play on the playground with everybody instead of going to your prayers. Well, I'm no, sorry. I mean, maybe we can do something that's constructive. Uh, I'm going to go say my prayers. Everybody else can go to the playground. But if you want me to come give a talk or kind of instruct, or there's a time, we, we'll come for all that stuff. So we, we do what we're supposed to do. So we make this analogously with the Mass resummarizing the whole salvation history. Because we see in Holy Mass, we see that you can, you can really find all of salvation history in one Mass. You got sometimes readings from the Old Testament. You got from the Gospel. You, you have all of these elements we'll find in the prayers, in the gestures, in things that are going on. You've got a reliving of salvation history. Not just the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord, but of salvation history itself, Right? Even at the very end, in the Thanksgiving prayer, you have, it you have it summarized again, which is a summary of the liturgy that just took place in the final gospel of St. John. So if you don't believe me, just go read that. So in some way, we're just making a comparison here. But in our life, in our daily life, it should be the same thing. We should be able to live with Christ. We should be able to be born with Christ in the obscurity, of, in the poverty of a cave. We should be able to live with Christ in the obscurity and the, in, the, in the quiet recollection of Nazareth. We should, we should be able to be with Christ, imitate Christ, and, uh, and, and live that in our day of the work that Christ had to do amongst the people. Then we should be able to suffer, to die, and to rise with Him. We should be able to do that every day. And where is the suffering, dying, and rising? You get given an obedience you don't want to do. You get given some hardship that you, you go into the, one of those funks when you wake up in the morning and you're just in a bad mood all day long and you want to take it out on somebody and everything hurts that day, mostly interiorly. Well, there you go. You've got a little cross to bear. That's going to be hard. And then you wait until the resurrection. There's always a resurrection. And then finally, the table of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 10, 21. The table of the Lord. Now remember, this is either, when they use the word uh, they're saying either for the devil or for our Lord. It's the same with religious life. You're either living religious life for the devil or for our Lord. When we're not faithful to our public consecration, we are not living it for our Lord. We're not laying uh, the oblation of our vows on the table of the Lord. So we've come to religious to be set aside. That's what consecrated means. It means to be put apart, to be set aside. A chalice that is consecrated. They used to consecrate them. Now they bless them. Uh, but so get an old chalice that has been consecrated and it has been set aside. You don't dare pour Pepsi in it. You don't put Pepsi in a chalice. It's been consecrated. You can put it in a chalice that's just made for Pepsi, but you don't take something that's used for the Lord and drink Pepsi out of it. You see, they might do that nowadays. I don't know, but you don't want to do that kind of thing because that chalice has been set aside just like a religious has been set aside from the world. So they're not to do profane things. We're not to act profanely. We don't need to take pictures holding cats, wrapping ourselves in Christmas lights and laughing our heads off. We don't have to act profanely. We're to, we also don't have to act like we're, we're, we're rigid you know, some kind of rigid understanding of what we think an angel might be. We're real human beings that have to do real human things. But we're set aside for the service of God, not to do the, the human mundane things anymore. 
Not, not being that we can't go on a walk, we can't have recreation, we can't, we can't um, uh, play a game or do, do whatever it might be, but we don't do the profane anymore because we've consecrated ourselves to God. So we have come to religious life to be set aside, not to do what we want, but rather to do, in our case, what the Immaculate Virgin would have us do. You see? Our whole form of life our whole form of consecration, our vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience are only understood according to our consecration. To be, to live, to work, to suffer, and to long to die is what St. Maximilian Kolbe, and he's, oh, sorry, let me, I forgot one. To live, work, suffer, be consumed, and long to die is what St. Maximilian Kolbe said. Our whole life, our whole death, and our whole eternity being handed over to her. So if you've actually done that, then how is it that you get upset when you get asked to do something that you really desire to do something else? How is it that you still have a will? How is it that you're upset because something's gone wrong? To live, work, suffer, be consumed, and long to die. That is an ejaculatory prayer. It comes from our consecration, but that's something you should say. If you find things hard sometimes, in the obediences that you're given or the brothers that you have to be around or whatever it is or because you don't ever get recognized for what other brothers get recognized for and you have better talents than they do but nobody ever acknowledges you, blah, 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 blah. Then you can constantly have this, this ejaculatory prayer. I came here to live, work, suffer, be consumed and long to die all for Our Lady. That's what I came to do. My whole life, my whole death, my whole eternity. It doesn't matter if everything goes wrong. If everything goes wrong, you offered your whole life, your whole death, your whole eternity. All for the Blessed Virgin. However, to take possession of ourselves or to seek our own will, it makes us liars. Because we publicly offered it, we publicly said, we will not take back our own will. We publicly said we, 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 we will live chastely. We publicly said that we will be poor. It makes us liars and thieves, and that's what makes us serve the table of the devil. Do you see? Not the table of the Lord. It effectively puts us in complete conformity and imitation of Satan because it makes us, it makes us say the non serviam. We won't serve. I signed up for it, but I'm not going to do that. And that's why it always comes up to the fact of, and I've, I've mentioned it before, when it's time for you to leave religious life because you've decided you don't want to serve God anymore, you're not going to take the blame. You're going to blame somebody else. That's just the way they do it. There's no charity. There's no this, there's no that. They're like this, they did this. It's always, you turn into a little monster, non serviam. But to live our lives no longer for us, but for Our Lady, who trans, trans, transforms our life into a uh, glory of God, remember? Religious life is for the glory of for the glory and honor of God is the primary purpose of religious life. The glory and honor of God and the good of our neighbor. First, the glory and honor of God, then the good of our neighbor. Americanism would be for the glory and honor of our neighbor <laughs> and for, I don't know, something to God. But it, 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 we have to put God at the center. So religious life is for the glory and honor of God and then the good of our neighbor. And this is the serving of the table of the Lord. Do you see the difference? And that's what makes our observance, or should make, that's one aspect that should make our observance, our religious life, a very high calling, but one that's not just a high, I mean, it's a high calling in and of itself, but we have to aspire to that high calling. The liturgy is the greatest thing that can, uh, that is the sacrifice of the Mass, is the greatest thing that can be offered to God. So for a Christian, 
the greatest way to offer one's life to God is in the service of God in the religious state. By God's grace, we've been brought here. By God's grace, we've been able to make vows. And by God's grace alone, we will be able to live it and to continue to live that liturgy which allows us to give that perfect honor and glory to God. And we always do it, even if we're not out there at a soup kitchen, for the good of our neighbor. Because when, when it comes to grace, grace is what converts. Grace is what helps. Grace is what consoles. Grace is what men need. And grace isn't. Grace isn't necessarily what is bought by feeding somebody at a soup kitchen. It's grace that allows you to feed somebody a soup kitchen, but grace is obtained through prayer and a life of sacrifice. So first and foremost, before we ever get to the good of our neighbor on the physical, we have to provide for the good of our neighbor in the, in the spiritual. And that's, that's done through what St. Francis called the Knights of the Round Table. And that's who we are, because our life is hidden. The Knights of the Round Table were hidden. And we're a bit hidden away here. So we live that life and we try to live it as perfectly as we can for the good of our neighbor, but for, for the, for the uh, uh, first and foremost, for the glory and the honor of God. Remembering sacrifice has adoration. Sacrifice has reparation. Sacrifice has thanksgiving. And, th- and sacrifice has petition. Even a petition thanksgiving would be the other direction. All right. Any questions?